So up next, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about two topics that go together hand in hand, and you'll ever wonder why you hear one without the other. Um, it's Bluetooth and skateboarding. Um, and for that, uh, we've got Jonas Shivik and Ferdi Emiko. Put your hands together. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so now we are going to talk about um, something we built kind of by accident, uh, a BLE stack in Rust, um, which was kind of fun. And also how this interacts with uh, skateboarding and how it can be used like in combination with each other. So about us, um, I'm Jonas Schiebing. Um, I've been using Rust since uh, roughly the 1.0 era, kind of where it all started to become a little more stable. Um, I'm generally interested in everything that is close to the metal. So this includes obviously embedded stuff, uh, but also um, things like compilers and emulation and stuff like that. Yeah. So now I'm ha uh, handing off to Ferdia so he can introduce you to what we are actually like dealing with here. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm Ferdia. Um, I've got slightly less Rust experience and slightly less embedded experience. Um, I'm generally uh, uh, interested in everything with an electric motor, you can see on my blog. Uh, and to start us off, we're going to talk about the legality. Very exciting, I know. So uh, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group has a very tight grasp on uh, usage of the, th of the stuff they own, which includes all their trademarks. Now, we're a, um, this is a you know, private project, so we have done neither of the two things that they uh, ask you to do. And therefore, we have to use um, assets we created ourselves. <laughs> So to start off, um, what is BLE? Well, it was um, originally envisioned in 2001 in a Nokia laboratory where they saw that there were some areas in which the existing standards didn't really cover. Um, and they published their findings in 2004. And in 2010, we have the core specification version uh, 4.0. Uh, sorry, and oh dear, oh sorry. And Jonas here is, is going to explain about some of the existing stacks. Yeah, so we took a look around and um just had a quick survey of what's available in terms of BLE stacks. And what we found was that uh, the existing open source BLE stacks are either very limited and experimental, just like uh, our stack is right now. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully that's going to change in the future. Or they were very um, specific and like require you to use a specific real-time operating system and you could not use the stack without the RTOS. So, um, and they, uh, all the stacks, um, both open source and closed source, were all written in C or C++. Or, well, for the closed source stuff, we technically can't tell, but it's very likely that they are written in these languages. So um, they are also highly privileged. So whatever is running on uh, an Android phone or on like a computer is generally run in kernel mode. Uh, and for embedded devices, it's uh, basically all running in the same privilege level in most of the cases. Um, so this is also um, kind of a security problem. If you write these in C and make a mistake, then uh, what ends up happening is that there might be, it might be possible to exploit that vulnerability you introduced by accident. And uh, because it's a wireless protocol, like right, there's, there's no, not really anything um, tricky you have to do. You just have to send a few packets over the air that have your payload in them and trigger the exploit, and then you like. Uh, are in someone's uh, smartwatch or something. So obviously that's not good. So you might not need physical access, you might not need user interaction. Some exploit might require user interaction, but I mean, who reads messages? Just click OK and suddenly you have some sort of exploit running on your phone. You obviously don't want that. So obviously uh, this happened. Um, there was this um, collection of vulnerabilities called Blueborn. Um, and these affect basically everything you can think of, operating systems, phones, all kinds of Internet of Things devices, smart home integrations. Um, it's not limited to BLE. It's also in normal classic Bluetooth stacks, um, leading to all kinds of fun stuff, memory corruption, stack overflows, the usual stuff, uh, and obviously also remote code execution, which is what you definitely don't want to happen. Yeah, so one of the issues with uh, Bluetooth is that it's incredibly complex, and the researchers have pointed this out as one of the reasons for um, 
for these attacks to land. So as you can see, there's like these many standards that are less than a thousand pages and implement something that's extremely useful like Wi-Fi or PCIe. Uh, even your average Bible only has 1,200 pages, roughly. And meanwhile, Bluetooth is over here with, over th with almost 3,000 pages. So uh, clearly, this is not very easy to implement. It takes a lot of time, and there's lots of room for error. So yeah, why use Rust for this? So clearly, there's the safety aspect. So implementing 3,000 pages is going to involve a lot of bugs. E regardless of whether you do it in Rust or C or C++. You always are going to end up having a lot of bugs. Uh, for C, um, this might lead to a remote code execution vulnerability, which is extremely bad. With Rust, this is not the case, of course. But there's also more things, things to it. For example, embedded can be hugely frustrating for multiple reasons in general. Um, for example, you need you sometimes need very expensive hardware, like an oscilloscope, uh, an expensive debug probe to properly do debugging on your hardware. If you can't afford that, you are limited to very simple tools that maybe not have all the functionality or are not reliable. And of course, that's frustrating. There's also uh, the problem with uh, vendor tooling. Like there's some vendor, I'm sure you know of a vendor that um, has tools that isn't quite up to what you uh, are what you should be expecting in 2019 in, to, in embedded tooling. Um, it might be like using decades old technology that has not, not really advanced or is just unreliable in general, so that's frustrating. The official vendor support, as you've heard in other talks today, is often just C, C++, and assembly. Uh, sometimes you also get uh, a scripting language on top of that, but that uh, can't be really be used for um, anything that's real time. Um, another thing with many microcontrollers is that the zero address is often just valid, so you can access it, you can load from it, and you will get data back. It's most likely not what you want to do, but you can. So this is also more a problem in, uh, in languages like C, where you can dereference a null pointer. This might be undefined behavior, or it might not be, because zero is also a valid address, so you might still get the data back instead of a re uh, predictable crash of your application. So, uh, and while Rust doesn't magically solve the issue that oscilloscopes are expensive, of course, it will help you with this sort of stuff. And if we can get vendors to support it properly, um, it might draw a large amount of people into embedded, as you've also, as we've heard today in many talks, that uh, Rust is kind of a sort of entry drug into embedded uh, development. So it's, of course, as I've said, um, memory safety is important here. We've also heard today that crates.io is extremely cool. We have so many crates we can just depend on use. Uh, even in embedded, there's less crates we can use, but there's still a lot. Like We can just pull in basically every imaginable data structure or algorithm from crates.io and just use it. C doesn't have that. Uh, so this makes um, stuff much easier to do. And this, uh, and my pet theory is that this is also the reason why the existing stacks always depend on a real-time operating system because th this will offer you the sort of stuff you can, we can just pull from crates.io. So you basically depend on an entire operating system just to get a few things like mutexes and, and things that are useful. We don't have to do that, so we can run with any op real-time operating system. Rust also offers generics, and we'll come back to this later, because <laughs> generics are actually really, uh, have, have been extremely useful for our BLE experiments. Um, we also have enums and, um, Enums, well, I mean, many languages have enums, but they work differently in Rust, as you, as probably most of you know, uh, because you can associate data with each uh, variant the enum can assume. So this is incredibly useful uh, if you're implementing any sort of network protocol, um, because you can just directly put the data in there, and you can see, you can just take a single look at the enum and see the possible, like, things you can put in a packet or send over the wire. And this is a really cool language feature. So there's lots of potential in embedded, this, and which, which is still mostly untapped, uh, because, well, like I've said, vendor support isn't really there yet, because they are silicon vendors, and they are slow, and they don't like new stuff. Um, but of course, we are also working on it. Uh, the, Rust has made huge improvements over the last couple of months or years um, in embedded support, and. I think if we continue doing this, we will get to a state where embedded is actually really fun and not as, not as frustrating at all. So yeah, let's talk about what we actually built. So our BLE stack is called Rubble. 
Uh, we are currently targeting version 4.2 of the specification. Um, we, aim for, we are aiming for making an entirely memory safe stack, so the uh, actual core implementation does not contain a single unsafe. Um, it's also supposed to be hardware independent, so you can, um, you basically get an API that you have to implement for the supported chip, um, and then it will just work with that chip family. Uh, you basically have to wrap the radio and implement a few functions. Um, so this makes it pretty portable. And you will only have to use a bit of unsafe code when actually manipulating the registers of the radio and by doing this, uh, putting this in like one place that can be easily audited, we uh, can make the stack much more, much more memory safe in practice. At least we believe that. Like it hasn't been formally tested, but yeah, by not putting, by not using any unsafe code in the core stack, we are making it just vastly easier to implement these 3,000 pages of specification. So right now we only support uh, the Nordic NRF52 uh, series of, radio, uh, of uh, microcontrollers, um, but of course additional MCUs are always uh, welcome to be supported, and we are also planning on uh, making that easier and on looking into it ourselves. So we also, of course, don't require any real-time operating system, but you can, of course, still use one if you like. Uh, you can use RTFM if you want, but also you don't have to do that. Uh, the stack is currently pretty minimal. Um, so it fits in less than 20 kilobytes of flash um, with uh, this example running, which is um, a generic attribute profile uh, enumerating a, a dummy service without any data. So anything you do on top of that will, of course, increase that. But the basic stack, uh, including connections and everything on the link layer, and that uh, always uh, that that all fits in less than 20 kilobytes of flash, uses 450 bytes of SRAM uh, without really putting any effort into optimizing the size. Yeah. So here you can also see an NRF 52A10 uh, running the demo application. Of course, you can't really see what it's doing, but this is one of the things we've used in our project, and. So let's take a look at what it actually takes to implement uh, a BLE stack. So this is kind of the uh, layers of the Bluetooth BLE protocol. We start down here at the physical layer. This is uh, basically entirely implemented in the hardware and in the radio, so we don't really have to deal with that except for interfacing with it, which is always going to be a bit hardware dependent. Uh, then there's the link layer on top of that, which actually deals with establishing a connection, advertising that some device wants to establish a connection, and then doing that. Um, it also, it's also doing channel hopping, which is something Bluetooth uses to avoid interference. So it's basically changing the frequency it communicates at uh, every few milliseconds. So this is all stuff done in, the, uh, done in Rubble in, in software, in the link layer. Um, on top, then uh, once the link layer is connected, uh, you can use the protocols on top of that, which is uh, firstly the L2 cap layer, which is lo the logical link control and adaptation protocol. This is basically similar to how TCP has multiple ports you can connect to. Uh, L2 cap just has multiple channels you can uh, send data through. So you can put multiple things on top of the L2 cap layer, which is in this case the security manager here, which is uh, mostly used for actually pairing devices, for doing key exchange and for bonding devices. Um, this is partially implemented. Uh, we don't do any actual cryptography yet, so there's no pairing support, but the security manager is, itself exists and uh, the protocol is partially implemented. Then you've got the attribute protocol, which is basically BLE's, uh, one of BLE's main data exchange facilities. Uh, like, uh, for example, a device will use the attribute protocol to do service discovery and um, to basically exchange small amounts of data and set values, read values from the device. There's also the LE signaling channel, which is not yet implemented because we didn't need it, and it only does a few things that you might need for more advanced things. But yeah, right now it doesn't exist. So on top of the attribute protocol, there's the generic attribute profile, which is basically just a way to, uh, of specifying how the attribute protocol is going to be used to um, advertise services and uh, how these services are going to be accessed by a, a device that connects to the embedded uh, device or something. So this is basically, this is basically can be seen as one unit, kind of, because there's not, no way to use the attribute, attribute protocol without GET. Yeah. Okay, obviously, um, 
we are uh, we've spent quite a long time um, <laughs> dealing with uh, um, the BLE implementation and also doing some doing many things wrong. So we've learned quite a few lessons do, doing this. For example, there's no um, we right now we don't really have a um, any framework that can be used to define the packet layout on the wire or in the air um, uh, on a bit by bit or byte basis. So we do have SERDA and that works on embedded, but it's only for predefined serialization protocols. And for um, implementing something like BLE or uh, even TCP, what you want is you want to define what each bit in the packet stands for, and you don't want any um, protocol like you don't want any format like JSON or some or a message pack around that. You just want to define what the bits mean. So uh, we kind of worked around that by writing our own infrastructure in uh, the bytes.rs module in the stack, and that basically just offers uh, traits we implement manually for everything that needs to be turned into bytes and be converted back from bytes. Because um, one of the things that also makes this tricky is that we need to be need to do this without copying data around and without heap allocations. Uh, so is, this is all zero copy and can basically directly borrow data from the um, receive buffer from the radio, um, which also uh, makes would make such a framework pretty difficult to design design um, because this is just not very simple to do. Yeah. Another lesson. Um, as you've seen in a previous presentation in C, you often use like these if macros or if dev constructs to tell the preprocessor which parts of the program to include. And you can do that on not just a function basis, but also like a statement basis and even a to sing single like token basis if you want to. You shouldn't, but you can. Um, kind of to complement this, you have also seen that Rust has the CFG hell kind of. Like you can put a CFG attribute on a function and only enable the function in certain cases. This is uh, a bit more manageable than if def because you can only put it on um, like blocks or on functions itself themselves and on modules if you want. Um, this is but, but this is still not optimal because it's difficult to test. You have to actually build the thing with all combinations of CFG flags enabled and disabled, and that takes a huge amount of time. Uh, and makes it very difficult to actually test the code locally because you have to build the crate like 15 times or something. And we didn't want that. So instead of doing that, we used generics instead, which can be kind of used to do basically the same thing um, as long as you don't like depend on any things that are operating system specific, but we don't really deal with that now. Um, the only CFG we are using is for enabling logging and that basically just switches the um, info warn and debug macros from the log crate with our own macros that are just empty. So when it's disabled, um, everything else is done using generics. For example, you can see here, this is the attribute protocol server. It's it is uh, generic over anything that can provide attributes. So this is an abstraction over the data because here the only thing that actually changes is the actual attributes the server will provide. The protocol and everything remains the same. Um, for the security manager, however, it's a bit different because uh, there you can plug in a security level here, which can either be no security, which will basically disable the entire protocol and always just like it will receive a command and say, no, I don't support this, I don't want pairing, go away. Um, or you can plug in secure connections, with the, which is actually the implementation that does the useful thing uh, that does the actual pairing. Uh, so if, as long as you use no security, you don't pay the cost of the other implementation at all, even though it's still in the code, it's still getting built, it still has to compile or the build will fail. But this is an abstraction over behavior instead of data. So this is kind of a cool revelation we had um, in the middle of the implementation that this is actually uh, a more preferable solution to using CFGs uh, if, if it's possible. And in our case it was, and was clearly better in this case. Another lesson, uh, I've said this, uh, I've just mentioned logging. Um, we are using logging a lot, like everywhere. Um, but logging is a bit difficult on embedded because there's no like console you can print to. There's just like a chip and you have to somehow get the data out of there. And so you have to hook up some sort of UART bridge to the PC or to, or to so anything really that can display your logs because you really want to see them. 
Um, we've also found out that the uh, formatting machinery is really, really slow. So just writing a literal took over 100 microseconds on our um, chip that we've used. So what we would really like to have is a logging crate that internally actually uses binary encoding for the stuff you want to log. And uh, basically does all the decoding and formatting, all stuff, all the things that can be uh, slow on, the, on a power more powerful PC that's connected to the device. So this would be really nice to have. Yeah. Now we've talked about uh, what Rubble does. <laughs> Let's talk about what it doesn't do. <laughs> so right now it's um, very bare bones. So we only have a uh, generic attribute profile implemented, kind of, in a um, really bare bones way. And we also have beacons running. You can also scan for beacons, so that's al already working pretty well. It's also uh, not approved by the SIG, as Fadia said. Um, because this takes a lot of time and a lot of money, and we also might not be completely compliant yet, because that is a lot of work, uh, because it's 3,000 pages, and implementing them is like just two people working on it is kind of taking a while. <laughs> so yeah, right now there's no use in commercial products. However, uh, Ferdi is now going to tell you what you can use it for. Sure, thanks. So, um, as Jonas said, there's no use in commercial projects, but there are plenty of, thi of cool things you can do um, for hobbyist and open source projects. Uh, that includes home automation. We plan on adding uh, HomeKit support as its own crate. Um, other uh, HID devices will, uh, could be added. Um, beacons, if anyone scans for an Eddystone beacon right now, uh, there will be one that takes you to the Rubble repository. Um, and it also uh, is an easy way of adding telem telemetry into any um, drones or uh, rocket model rockets or anything like that. Um, next, I'm going to explain that in, for, in terms of the commercial offerings of electric longboards, there are, uh, the, the most polished product is made by boosted boards. They provide you with a physical board, a controller for, uh, that you ha hold in your hand that uh, adjusts the, the speed, and they also provide mobile and smartwatch apps. And this whole system integrates um, very nicely. You know, the, there's notifications when your board is finished charging. You can uh, view your speed and how much, uh, how much further you can go while you're uh, using the board. Um, and I really want to, uh, but unfortunately, this is very expensive um, and it's all proprietary. And I wanted to provide the same level of experience for um, open source users. So I've been working on a project called Bluefly. So it's a remote control system, uh, just like uh, the one pr uh, provided by uh, Boosted Boards. It works on the same NRF 52 modules, and all the hardware and software is open source, except for the MCU. Um, now, it's not as polished, um, <laughs> but it's, it's getting there. Um, the current implementation uses uh, beacons and then uh, and, and, and a type of analog signal to control the motor, and it's uh, only one direction. Uh, in the future, I want to have full communication all the way through and add uh, mobile and desktop apps for telemetry. Um, this is the two boards I designed and built. Um, this one we oh, oh dear. This one we uh, use for debugging rubble. Um, and it, the board I built is small to fit in most uh, existing enclosures, and it makes it easy to add um, displays or whatever else the, the controller may have. So the big question is whether it actually works. And so I'm wearing a helmet not because I don't trust the code that I wrote, but because I promised my mom. So um, we will have a demo in very shortly. Bear with, bear with me. Should have taken out of the bag. As we can see, we have a functioning Bluetooth remote. <laughs> Thank you very much. But can we go further? Because the offerings by uh, Boosted Boards also had some really cool features in the board itself. That includes you know, wireless firmware updates, cool telemetry, um, and this board doesn't have that right now. Um, there is some existing software for motor, motor drivers. Unfortunately, it's not very portable, and it always relies on external hardware for the advanced features instead of having it built in as one board and one um, code base. Sorry. Um, so I've been working on some software called Crankshaft, which um, is a motor driver firmware with uh, two, sorry. 
uh, two main tasks, a high priority task for spinning the motor and a low priority task for running a web interface on top of a uh, small TCP and an ENC28J60. We have a video of this working here. So you can go to the uh, web interface and it'll spin the motor. Um, now this can't be used for uh, the board itself, and I planned on doing that. Unfortunately, some uh, items were seized by German customs, so I wasn't able to um, get the hardware for it in time. Uh, but I did, I did rig up this small demo, and I've got the thing here just to prove I'm not lying. Uh, sorry, now Jonas is going to talk about some of the future plans we have for the software. Yeah, so uh, as you've seen, Rubble is already kind of usable for some simple applications. Um, but we want to... Um, some important things that are still missing is a more convenient way to define uh, GAD services and characteristics that are exposed, so you can actually implement. So most of most of the um, additional specifications building on top of the core BLE spec are built on top of GAD, so we kind of have to have a good interface for that, so you can start implementing those and using them. Um, we also want to support pairing. As I've said, the security manager exists, but it doesn't do pairing yet. Uh, this is mostly because um, we uh, couldn't manage to get Ring working on Embedded. I don't think it's supported yet on at least um, Thumb V7 devices. So uh, we need some way to do uh, cryptography, um, spe uh, especially uh, ECDSA. Um, yeah, and as Ferdia said, we want also want to build uh, some sort of HomeKit uh, support, not directly into Rubble, but uh, as its own crate using Rubble for the BLE, because HomeKit is basically a specification that just happens to use BLE, but it's doing a lot of own, its own cryptography and stuff on top of it, so it makes sense to put it in its own crate. Yeah, for the um, remote, Bluefly, we, uh, uh, Ferdi has already said this, we want real Bluetooth connections um, and an app that can actually uh, connect to it and display useful information. There's also a few hardware improvements. Uh, for example, the PCB you just said was just a first revision. It's actually Pretty cool that actually we actually managed to make this work because usually the first revision doesn't work. <laughs> um, so we want to add uh, mounting holes, um, onboard display circuitry. So there's going to be the OLED um, integrated into the remote to display, to display uh, f just for displaying information about the board like battery and speed, um, and also con cor correct some mistakes and do some minor improvements to the other minor improvements to the hardware. Yeah, for the motor driver. Um, this is going to, um, there's, there the plan is to add field-oriented control um, to the motor, um, to, uh, yeah, to the motor, um, which means that you actually uh, listen for feedback from the, mo from the motor coils, um, because as the motor turns, uh, there's a current induced into the coils, and you can measure that and decide for the best moment to uh, switch to the next phase and actually induce as much torque as possible into the motor. Uh, we also want to add telemetry to crankshaft uh, and also wireless firmware updates using BLE and uh, over the air updates. Yeah. This is, uh, this is it. <laughs> Here's the project links. You can also try using the beacon to get there. <laughs>